Good morning and welcome to Compass Christian Church's online worship service. We welcome you to the second Sunday of Advent, only 19 shopping days till Christmas. Won't you join me now in our opening hymn? Told when all shall dwell together, secure and manifold. Let war be learned no longer, let strife and tumult cease. All earth a blessed garden that God shall tend in peace. Let all that now divides us remove and pass away. Like this of early morning before the blaze of day. Let all that now unites us more sweet and lasting prove. A closer bond of union in blessed lands of love. O long expected dawning, come with your cheering ray. Yet shall the promise beckon and lead us not astray. O oh, sweet anticipation, it cheers the watchers on To pray and hope and labor till Christ's new realm is come. And now I would like to welcome Lyle and Laura Daly for the lighting of our Advent candle. We live on the brink every day. We stand on the threshold between this world and the next one. We live and move between the ordinary and divine, between the mundane and the mystery. Too often, we forget to look up and see the angels in our living room. We forget that the love we give and live is a sign of eternity, God with us, right now. We forget that company is coming. Luke tells us that God's favor came to a girl, an ordinary girl. It might have been you or your daughter. It might have been the girl down the street or your grandchild. The messenger of God came and greeted her and said, The Lord is with you. What a gift and a promise. Emmanuel, God is with us. We light this candle with peace in our hearts for the promise of proximity, the nearness of God. Even when we forget to listen, to lean into that presence, God is as close as our own breath. This, in a confused and confusing world, is a peace that passes all understanding. It is the peace that knows that company is coming. Having lit the candle of peace, let us sing, One Candle is Lit. Come quickly, shalom, teach us how to prepare For a gift that compels us with justice to care Our spirits are restless till sin and war cease 
One candle is lit for the reign of God's peace. We're grateful you're joining us today and holding you in prayers. Please go online to compassc.org. Forward your prayer request and our church will pray for you. Consider joining the ways we're extending care into our community or supporting with an online gift our Helping Hand Fund to assist those that need a hand up. We're grateful for your interest and most especially for your presence and prayers. I invite you to join me in prayer. Let us pray. God of mercy, as we continue this Advent season, we live into a new church year. We are grateful that starting anew doesn't need to wait until January 1st, but can begin today. Looking back on the year behind us, peace has taken a beating. We yearn for peace, O oh God, as a deer longs for flowing streams as a dry and weary land aches for rain. We cannot generate peace on our own, but ask you to send your spirit to bring life in this barren wilderness. Strike our flinty hearts until streams of living water, bubbling with peace, gush forth to inundate our parched lives, gasping nation, and thirsty world. Let justice roll down as waters and righteousness as a mighty stream until the earth is full of the peace of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. May the seeds of peace that your Spirit has implanted within us take root and carpet this desert with abundant blossoms and succulent fruit to share. Remind us, lest we forget, that your Son was sent to just such a world, and that he comes again to claim this world for his own. It is in his name and by his peace within us that we pray. Amen. Our reading comes from the Isaiah chapter 11, verses 1 to 10. Listen for God's word. A shoot shall come out from the stump of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest on him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. His delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. He shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide by what his ears hear. But with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity for the meek of the earth. He shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked. Righteousness shall be the belt around his waist, and faithfulness the belt around his loins. The wolf shall live with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the kid, the calf and the lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child shall play over the hole of the asp. And the weaned child shall put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountain. For the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. On that day, the root of Jesse shall stand as a signal to the peoples. The nations shall inquire of him, and his dwelling shall be glorious." Here ends our reading. May God bless our hearing, understanding, and living of these words. There once was a shepherd who had a big problem. His neighbor's dogs were killing his sheep. 
It got so bad, he had to do something. So he examined his options. First, he could have brought a lawsuit and taken his neighbor to court, but he didn't want to make an enemy of his neighbor. Second, he could have built stronger fences so the dogs couldn't get in. But they had already been disputing about property lines, and building a fence would only have aggravated the situation. He had to find a solution. But what? A story about a shepherd, sheep, and dogs has something to tell us about our reading from Isaiah and its vision of peace. Let's take a look. When the Bible speaks of peace, shalom in the Hebrew, it means to be healthy, complete, well. It's not just the absence of war, but the presence of God and friendly relations between people. The good life for Judaism always included peace, health, and wholeness. Peace is what makes life complete, and within Judaism, peace is yoked with truth and justice. Peace is a sign of the blessed life, and such blessedness we find in the life of Jesus, whom we know as the Prince of Peace from the root of Jesse. In both Jewish and Christian scriptures, peace is of paramount importance what gives wholeness and healing to the world. We'll be looking at the range of meanings found throughout the Bible in order to get a more complete and well-rounded understanding of peace. As we receive the Advent season gifts before Christmas Day, we'll be looking at the gifts of peace today. The first Advent gift of peace is that it is paradise's purpose. To see this, we need only turn to the opening scene of creation where God brought the animals to man to see what he would call them. There's this wonderful scene of God parading the various animals before Adam and asking Adam, so, what does this one look like? And Adam would say hippopotamus, and platypus. There's a fundamental harmony in the Garden of Eden. The animals there know no fear because they're not yet on the menu of humanity. At this point, all Adam is eating are the plants of the earth and fruit from the trees. Animals aren't skittish at all around Adam because he's not yet looking at them as a meal. The closest I've come to experiencing that reality was in 1992 when I went hiking with my brother in Big Bend National Park in Texas, what Texans call the Grand Canyon of Texas. It's a wilderness area on the border with Mexico, with incredible vistas where you can see the Rio Grande meandering in the distance below. What was amazing to me was how the wildlife treated us as we hiked. We came across deer and javelinas, which are pig-like creatures, who were absolutely indifferent and unafraid of us. Why? Because there had been no hunting there for over 40 years. The wildlife hadn't learned to be afraid of humans. In Texas, I experienced a glimmer of the harmony of Eden, there in Big Bend National Park. The purpose of paradise was to have harmony between God, humans, animals, and plants. However, after eating the forbidden fruit, that original harmony is disrupted. Here's what Genesis 3.14 and following says, Serpent cursed, people and snakes will mutually hate, increased pain in childbirth, husband rule over you, ground cursed with weeds, toil for food, and death. Paradise's purpose 
is set awry through Adam and Eve's misdeed and the original harmony between God, humanity, and creation is now broken. Nevertheless, the original purpose of paradise is that God and creation would live in peace. The first advent gift of peace is paradise's purpose. The second advent gift of peace is that it enfolds equity. Peace must enfold equity or justice. As Psalm 85.10 says, righteousness, justice, and peace shall kiss. In the Hebrew mind, righteousness and justice are synonymous. Being right and doing right go together. There is an intimate, unbreakable bond between peace and justice. We cannot have one without the other. This continuity between peace and justice is not only seen in the Hebrew scriptures, but found in the New Testament as well. James 3.18 says, A harvest of righteousness, justice, is sown in peace for those who make peace. As seed is to harvest, so is justice to peace. Pope Paul VI said something profound. If you want peace, work for justice. If you want peace, work for justice. Consider that statement for a moment. There will be no peace in our world until there is justice in our world. Maybe the reason we have so little peace in our world is because so few of us are working for justice. Working for justice is often going to put us in the middle of conflicts because if we work for justice, it means sticking up for the little guys and gals. Working for justice means standing in solidarity with the oppressed, wherever they may be. It puts us on the line with unpopular causes for the world. Peace and justice take sides against entrenched powers that be. Ask Dr. King, Mahatma Gandhi, Nelson Mandela, Black Lives Matter advocates, and others. Justice and peace are intertwined. A second advent gift of peace is that it enfolds equity. A third aspect of peace is that it is assertive action. Assertive action is another part of peace. As Psalm 34:14 says, do good, seek peace, pursue it. Peace is an action, something pursued, something one does, not simply something that falls into our lap. Peace is something sought after, pursued, and done. Peace is something one can lay hold of and isn't a mere product, but an end in itself. As Jesus said, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Jesus is saying, that peace isn't something that happens by accident, but can be created. It's not something one stumbles into, but something we take action toward. Christian author Jim Wallace says, anyone can love peace. But Jesus didn't say, blessed are the peace lovers. He says, peace makers. He is referring to a life vocation, not a hobby on the sidelines of life. Most everyone says they love peace, but how many of us are making peace? And it's important how we go about making peace in this world. Notice I said assertive, not aggressive action. For as Peter's story says, Making peace is infinitely more difficult than resisting evil. For Jesus and his followers, 
evil must be resisted, but not to the point of violence. Jesus tells his followers to love their enemies, not kill them. When Peter cuts off the ear of the slave Malchus when Jesus is being arrested, Jesus says, put away your sword. Those who live by the sword will die by the sword. Jesus then undoes that act of violence by healing the slave's ear. When the Roman governor Pilate interrogates Jesus about whether he is king of the Jews, Jesus says, My kingdom isn't from this world. If it were, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over. The way of Jesus is the way of nonviolence. That is how he lived and how he expects those who are his followers to live. The best the world can achieve, it seems, is detente, or a ceasefire between hostilities. The peace, peace which the world proclaims, whether at the end of a spear or at the end of a gun, isn't peace at all. Means and ends must cohere. We cannot achieve peace through violence. As Brazilian Archbishop Dom Helder Camara said, my personal vocation is to be a pilgrim of peace. We, as Christians, are on the side of nonviolence, and this is in no way an option for weakness and passivity. Opting for nonviolence means to believe more strongly in the power of truth justice and love than in the power of wars, weapons, and hatred. Nonviolent struggles and revolutions in the 20th century freed 3.3 billion people from oppression, over half the human race. No one can ever say again that nonviolence doesn't work. It's a force more powerful than all the armies of the world. Peace is assertive because it demands God's justice for the world. Assertive action is the third gift of peace. A fourth Advent gift of peace is that it is our Christian calling. We are called to peace as Christians. As Jesus says, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Jesus left his peace as a gift for us and for all. As Hebrews 12, 14 says, pursue peace with everyone. Peace is something we are to have at all levels of our lives, in every relationship. The peace that Jesus left with us is to permeate all areas of our lives. Greeks were most concerned about interior peace, the inner peace for which each of us yearns. We are called to have peace within ourselves, and Jesus makes that possible. Interpersonal peace, the concern of Judaism's shalom, was to be a hallmark of the Christian community, composed as it was of former enemies like Jews and Gentiles, slave and free. Paul highlights peace as a constituent component of congregations who follow Christ. We are called to have peace among ourselves as fellow believers, and Jesus makes this possible. Communal peace is what pursue peace with everyone is all about. Not just peace among fellow believers, but among the pagan communities in which these believers found themselves. Christians were known in the ancient world, not only for peace among themselves, but also with their neighbors. We are called to peace 
in the communities where we live. And Jesus makes that possible. Finally, peace is to permeate all corners of the globe. Because the coming of the Prince of Peace wasn't just to Israel, but to all people. Jesus' coming wasn't just to Jewish shepherds, but to Gentile wise men too. Acts 10.36 speaks of the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. Peace through Jesus is for all people everywhere. We are called to a global movement for peace, and Jesus makes this possible. Peace is to permeate every aspect of our lives, from the individual, congregational, communal, and global. As Christians, we are called to peace. This is the fourth Advent gift. The fifth and final aspect of peace that Jesus brings us is that it embraces enemies. This peace reconciles those who were once estranged from each other. Isaiah 11, 6 and following paints a picture for us that the wolf shall live with the lamb, leopard with kid, calf and lion, cow and bear, child and snake. Did we notice that? Children will play with snakes and not be harmed. There's a reversal, an undoing of the fall where Adam, Eve, and the snake were cursed. Instead of enmity between the serpent and people, now a child will put its hand on the adder's den. They will not hurt or destroy. Former animal and human enemies will be reconciled, and all creation will know peace. The sign of that peace in the world is the church, a demonstration project of the peace which Isaiah speaks of and which Christ inaugurates in his ministry and through his members. Seeming enemies and opposites are reconciled in the reign of peace that Jesus brings. The author of Revelation puts it this way, in two verses which follow immediately upon each other. The lion of the tribe of Judah, a lamb standing as if it had been slaughtered. Did we see that? A lion and lamb right next to each other. The author of Revelation sees in Jesus' own person the reconciliation of the Lion of Judah and the Lamb that was slaughtered. In Jesus, the promise of Isaiah is fulfilled, where Lamb and Lion are at peace with one another. In Jesus, seeming enemies are reconciled. In Revelation, the predominant image for Jesus is the lamb that was slaughtered, a paradoxical way to portray power. Eddie Fox was the general secretary of world Methodist evangelism when the Berlin Wall fell. After it fell and the communist governments of Eastern Europe collapsed, he observed a sign placed in a churchyard of a little Methodist church in Prague, Czechoslovakia. The sign went up the very first day after the fall of the Berlin Wall. It read, The Lamb Wins. Fox notes, Not the bear, not the lion, not the tiger, but the lamb. The lamb wins. The power of the lamb that was slaughtered conquers. The fifth Advent gift of peace 
is that it embraces enemies. One other thing we're told about Jesus is that the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. Another paradoxical embrace of seeming opposites. This shepherd lamb, the prince of peace, will guide them to the springs of the water of life. Speaking of shepherds, remember the one whose neighbor's dog was killing his sheep? He didn't want to make an enemy through a lawsuit, nor aggravate property disputes by building a fence. What did this shepherd do? He found another way, a peaceful way, to ensure the health of his lambs. He gave some lambs to his neighbor's children, and the neighbor tied up the dogs, and his problems were over. Peace always finds a way, because it is the way of God. It is paradise's purpose. It enfolds equity and justice, acts assertively to be a peacemaker, is our Christian calling at all levels of our lives, and embraces enemies, reconciling us to God, each other, and all creation. Thanks be to God for Jesus and for his peace, which has the wisdom of the shepherd, the strength of the lion, and the gentleness of the Lamb of God, who is the Prince of Peace. Amen. We come now to our time of communion, where we gather around this table at Christ's invitation. Please don't feel that you are just watching communion happening here in this building. For the communion table extends outside these walls and into your very living rooms. Let us sing our hymn of invitation now. Christians, all your Lord is coming, drawing near in holy birth. Ring the bells and sound the trumpets, let your music fill the earth. Dance and move to show God's glory, kneel and pause to hear God's word. Alleluia, alleluia, rise and let your songs be heard. Christians, all your Lord is coming, calling you to serve indeed. See the ones who hurt and suffer, hear their cry and act with speed. Set all selfish ways behind you, purge your hearts of sinful greed. Alleluia, alleluia, Christ in you will meet their need. Christians, all your Lord is coming, he will rise up from the dead. Lift the cup of sin forgiven, bless the host and eat his bread. Mend the ways where peace is broken, give yourselves to true shalom. Alleluia, alleluia, dwell as one in church and home. 
is here that we enter a blessed garden that God tends, where strife ends and life mends through the fruit of the earth and heavenly grace. I would welcome you at this time to gather communion at your home, whether it be with wine or grape juice, some bread. We remember that when Jesus was gathered with his friends, he took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, Take, eat. This is my body, given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup. Again, he gave God thanks and praise, and he gave it to them, saying, Drink this, all of you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all, so that sin may be forgiven. For as often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again in glory. I invite you to join with me in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. May the God of peace fill you with all hope and joy in believing, so that you may abound in peace by the power of the Holy Spirit and the presence of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. Amen. Amen.